So uh, with me on the couch today, uh, all the way from, uh, from Brooklyn, New York City, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Mr. Randy Muller. Actually, uh, Randy, you moved out of Brooklyn, but you're still a Brooklyn boy at heart, I guess. Always Brooklyn. Okay, let me get the, you got your mute on the bottom. That's it. That's it. Ooh, yeah, this is this is a guy who's done so many uh, songs that he was just telling me. I had to print out a discography online because I don't remember. I'm embarrassed. I don't remember all the songs that I've done. Um, basically, obviously, the stuff that you were listening to when we came in um, were uh, his compositions and numerous other classics of the so-called disco era, the classic club scene uh, in New York City of the late 70s, early 80s. Yes. Um, but uh, before that, uh, there was, that, that music came out of funk, definitely. And before that, there was a lot of funk that, that you were involved in. Um, and I wanna, I wanna kinda give people a little bit of a background from where you started where you were born, how you how you came into the scene, and what that scene was like when you were a uh, a boy growing up. Ah, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for inviting me here. This is really a cool thing. Uh, this is my first time just checking out the scene. It was described to me, and I, you know, you said the Red Bull Academy stuff, and I expected you know more of a Harvard or Yale kind of setup, <laughs> you know, a very a back to school setup. And to come in here, I just got off the plane. You see my bags are behind there. Not a chance to even uh, you know, go to the, to the hotel or anything. But coming here, this is really, really a wonderful thing. I wish I had this when I was trying to you know, get into the business or you know, get started. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. You have the equipment I used to dream about. This is started like, oh my god, the studio and the equipment. And to have all these people, potential collaborators, together in one space. This is so almost so utopian in a way. I just love it, and I think only good things could come of this. Uh, you know, getting all these creative minds, you know, under one roof, and without the bother of you know taking out the garbage and going to the job and all that, and to have all this good stuff here and the access to you know each other, it's just fantastic. So I you know I, I really appreciate you know, being here. Um, to answer the question how I got started. Well, I was born in Guyana. Guyana is down in South America, right next to uh, Venezuela. And uh, that's 83,000 square miles, uh, a small country. And um, <clears throat> it's funny, I started out, you know, I used to bang on the stairs. Basically, pretty much, I had no instruments. I started out just banging on the stairs because I love percussion, you know, I just bang. So uh, we have these, you know, if you know some of the, you know, the countries in the Caribbean, we have these wooden stairs that goes up, you know, go up, just a piece of wood across, you know, a thing. And, you know, I'll find a tone on each step, right? I go, doom, 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 whatever. Uh, it wasn't so perfectly tuned, but, you know. And I would try to make music out of that. You know, in the afternoons, after I come from school, I sit there and, you know, put some coconut oil on my skin and just sit out there and try to make music. And what happened uh, later on, I remember getting the steel drum, they were, you know, the st steel drum, uh, the bands were very big, and the guys sometimes with the professional bands would throw out the steel pans, um, it, you know, uh, from the band. They had no more use, either it, was, it didn't sound as good as, I, you know, they had no more use for it. And I would go collect the old steel drums out the garbage and retune them, and I formed my first band. Uh, just taking the, the, the tin drums and just, you know, get some guys together and just, we started playing little songs, you know, on it. And uh, I think it was really cool and uh, it's my first time really getting into the band business, the music business in a way. And so much, I guess I had this entrepreneurial kind of thing where um, I had this idea, guys, we could make money, we could do some stuff with this. So I decided I want to play Christmas carols. Uh, which was a great idea. We could go and play Silent Night, and they'll give us, uh, you know, some money. That time, maybe a penny, two pennies, or three pennies, whatever. So there was no union scale. Uh, so, so but it was a great idea. Except uh, some people felt sorry for us when we went. We played the songs, and I got a few pennies. 
But it was I, I was, I guess I was a bad marketing guy. I wasn't cut out for the business side because it was the middle of August. <laughs> and you know, it, it, Christmas carols in the middle of August is not so syllable. You know, it's, it's not so cool. But I guess it felt sorry to suddenly little kids playing and they would still give us the money. And that was my start. So I started out just playing with the steel drums. And um, then I left uh, Guyana and came to Brooklyn, New York. And um, I thought it was such a cool place. First of all, I heard of America, this place, streets paved with gold and all this stuff you hear about. And I was telling someone the other day, I, I actually did see a kind of sparkly street and not realizing that they had this new as asphalt or something where they grind up the glass. <laughs> and to me, it's like, wow, the golden streets, you know, sparkling streets. But I came to Brooklyn and it was almost like a movie set for me because I would sit there and uh, I, I lived, uh, what was it, Hart Street. But the, you know, my window was right there near the side of work. My first night, I came into Kennedy Airport, and they whisked me, and I saw these lights. This is America, this place, big lights and stuff. And so I, I remember them taking me, and I went and got my room, and, and I hear guys singing in the streets just like the movies. They were doing like three, four-part harmonies. Do, 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 and just singing. This is like, this is like, like a wow, America is so cool. When was this? This was the, in the 1960s, like 1964 or something like that. And it was like unbelievable. The guys had the do rag and the process here, and they were walking around singing on the streets. Cool harmonies, I swear to God. And uh, so after that, I graduated from banging on the stairs, and I started taking the place, my dinner plates, my grandma's dinner plates, and playing them like a xylophone. You know, the big plates give me lower sounds, and the little plates give me the higher sounds. Uh, but then I, you know, I was in public school or something. Then I remember getting my first guitar. That's like my first instrument. Really, uh, my gra I was used to pass a pawn shop, and I saw this guitar. Uh, it was for sixteen dollars. This guitar, this is big time. So my biggest dream is to have this guitar. And I remember when my grandmother bought me that guitar. I was like, oh my god, I was gonna go crazy. I stayed up, didn't want to sleep. I wanted to play this guitar and do songs. And right about that time is when I got the flute. I, uh, you know, in school they asked you what instrument you're gonna play. And I wanted to play the flute so badly because when I was in Guyana, there used to be an old guy named George. I guess say he was a homeless guy, whatever. But he lived across the street in our little village. And every Christmas, he would play a Silent Night. I guess that's where I got the Silent Night from. He played these Christmas songs, and it was so cool because you know, first of all, I was waiting up to see Santa for myself, so I would never sleep. I act like I'm sleeping because I wanted to see Santa Claus if he's real or if he's coming or what he's bringing me. So while I'm up, I hear this beautiful music just like floating around, and it sounded so great. And I want to play like that guy. It sounded so fantastic. I wanted to be like George. And um, I tell you, I just made my first like flute solo album. And I guess thanks to this guy, who a lot of people say, oh, he's just a bum. He's just a, no, a homeless guy. But you, that shows you never know the kind of influences you're going to get. You know, this guy, you know. It's, it's kind of motivated me to do this, and up to now, I, I, I love this instrument with a passion, you know. So I got my start from, uh, you know, no, nothing fancy or anything like that. I just tried to use what I had around me, and um, then later on, I, I, I got into, um, I had a little band. A little, I played guitar with another fella. We used to play talent shows in the school, because first of all, we thought it was cool, because we get a lot of girls that way, and uh, it was really cool. We sang all the hot songs. Uh, a, a guy from, from Puerto Rico, a fellow named Joseph Alicia, and I don't know where he is, I've not seen him uh, since we were kids, but um, we made a lot of music together, playing my guitar, and then I went into junior high school, and that's when I guess this whole record, this whole professional phase really started. Um, I put together, there was a talent show in my junior high school, and um, I wanted to get some guys, you know, I was writing songs, um, you know, stuff I wrote on my plates, you know, so they actually turned out to be like songs. And so I um, wanted to get a couple of guys uh, with me. Um, I took band, I was in the seventh grade, and so we played, we had a band, a school band, and I saw, remember some guys in the band that, um, you know, pretty cool trumpet guy and stuff, so I figured I'd put them together. And, uh, you know, for this talent show, just for this talent show, I needed a drummer, a bass player, etc. So we got together. So I got together and, um, you know, got, I'm sorry, got some guys together and um, started playing these tunes. There were some very different guys. Um, I had one guy, he's now a, a big time actor. I saw him on um, a couple of pretty, what's his name? Um, pretty great, uh, some good movie. His name is uh, Goldberg. 
um, what's his first name? I forget. But he's a great uh, Michael Goldberg, a uh, great trumpet player. Um, and uh, matter of fact, we just took guys that was in the, the school the school band, and I had pretty much my own after school program. I would have I had like four trumpet guys and two sax guys, etc. And uh, we just like played music, you know, mess around with track things I wanted to play and fool around, just getting a couple of songs ready for uh, a concert. And uh, pretty much that evolved into the whole thing with uh, what a group called Dynamic Souls and Brass Construction and the rest what, of history. What, uh, what bands were you listening to at the time that gave you the inspiration to oh. work with brass sections like that? I, I always loved uh, the brass sound. There's something about it. Uh, at that time... Uh, who I listened to, I mean, well, there was a lot of influence from the Calypso bands, the, the Caribbean Calypso bands. I was born in the, you know, that's it, from the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean culture. So I listened to a lot of Mighty Sparrow and that kind of stuff. And these guys had pretty nice horn sections, you know. And I, you know, I love the rhythm, I like the sound, but I also like uh, the big band sound, you know, like the Duke Ellington sound and, and, and you know, Count Basie and that kind of stuff. It's interesting, in, in a country like Guyana, you know, we really had, in, in those days, I, I saw it happening, the same thing in England when I, you know, went there even in the early, in, this, in the late 70s and, and, and 80s. You know, you had real broadcasting. Broadcasting mean, in Guyana, we had the station where the population was mixed with Hindu, Indian, and you have the black population and the, the, the Chinese and everything. Interesting. But I had to listen through, you know, a few hours of Hindu programming before I get to hear, you know, the funk or, you know, whatever come on. So... I would hear the so and it was an interesting way I was introduced to other types of music and sounds, and uh, I think it was great because it helped me so much as an arranger. Someone brings me a song with a certain type of style they like, so you know I've you know I've heard it. I've listened to Jim Reeves, so I listen to country music, you know I would listen to you know um, uh, Glenn Miller, you know all this old stuff and you know uh, you know but. The kind of stuff I listened to big bands during that time, any kind of big band. I remember having it was just be a short wave radio, uh, and you would hear music from I don't know where it was coming from. Late at night, you know, the radio starts going, <laughs> and you're hearing music from someplace. A little guy in a megaphone sounding voice, but I used to love it. Just turn into the radio and hear what exciting stuff I would hear. Uh, in the middle of the night, you know. Did you ever hear any of the Latin bands that were big yes, at the time? Yes, yes, But some of them I didn't even know the name because, you know, I just hear it some during the night, the, the announcer, you could be hardly hear them. Mm -hmm. But I would hear all of this stuff and just to me, it's just some, some faraway place. It's just so cool, you know. It's a cool place, wherever that is, where that music is coming from. I want to be there. I don't want to do that, you know. So it was very, very interesting. And, it, you know, I guess it made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, at this time, you were what about to go into high school, right? Or uh, were you had you already uh, started high school at Jefferson at that point? No, um, the, the early stuff when we put the guys together for the talent show was actually seventh grade um, in uh, George Gershwin Junior High. Uh, it's funny how I went to Jefferson because before that, you know, in, in the Caribbean culture, my, well, my, at least my family, I could speak uh, more more specifically about. Um, they don't see music as something valuable. It's like you can see, It's like I'm telling. It's like me saying I want to be a robber. If I tell my father I want to be a musician, it's like I like to play music. Are you serious? You know, it's like a joke. Uh, anything in the art is not valued. You know, if you say I want to be an artist, it's like it's the worst thing you could say. You know, or I want to play music. Are you kidding me? You need a job. You need to do something. You know, that will help mankind. You know, so of course the, the, the first thing, a doctor or a lawyer or something fancy like that, you know, it's supposed to be highbrow stuff, you know. So uh, I had to try to satisfy both ends, and I think I had a very cool dad. You know, my father was like, he's a cool guy, you know. He loves, I mean, I'll tell you the story about him later on, but um, guys embarrass me sometimes. You know, I go to gigs, and the guy that goes, there goes, your dad, and he's on the floor, man. And he, the girls are around him. He's like, Mr. Cool. You know, like, oh, my God. He go, that's my son. That's my son. I'm so embarrassed. I feel like hiding under the drum set. But really cool. He's the one that got me into, you know, professional music. He introduced me to his friends, and I joined a band, a steel band. But it was a, a kind of cool steel band. You know, they had steel drums, which I played, but they had a drum set and a Fender bass, you know, uh, with, a, with an Ampec, you know, what's it, the B, what's the, the, amp, the amps outside? The Ampec, the amp. 
And it was an interesting mix of guitar with the steel band. It was interesting for that time, for 1967 or so, it was pretty hip. And the group, actually that local group called the Panamonics, was very successful in the area. We played you know, all the Caribbean gigs and the boat rides and the bus rides and stuff. But um, yeah, but to tell your family that you didn't want to, that you want to do uh, play music was uh, a big thing. And so I made a deal with my dad. You know, he basically said, you keep your grades up, you know, you do 90s work or whatever, you keep your grades up, you could play. And so that's what I did. I mean, you see backstage, I'm doing my homework and I go do the show and, and uh, it kind of worked out. Um, but, you know, music was not a thing that was much desired by, you know, in that culture is like, music is the worst thing. It's like telling, they say, oh my God, I'm a failure as a parent, you know. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> my kid wants to play music, you know. It's like, it's not a job. But, uh, you know, I guess it kind of worked out. But you did, uh, you, you told me a funny story one time is you actually were accepted at the high school for high academic yeah, achievers. Yeah, actually, yeah, I was supposed to go. But that wasn't the cool that's music right, high school. That's right. I actually was supposed to go to tech, and which is a really cool, it was an all-boys school, you know, the, the big minds, the scientist guys go there, you know, they all go to MIT afterwards and do great things for mankind. And I actually lied to my grandmother and said I didn't pass the test because all the cool guys are going to the other high school. It's really cool over there. So I just said I didn't make it. I'm sorry. I wasn't good enough. And, and I went with the cool school where we had lots of music, beautiful girls. And it was great. And a very supportive teacher. I mean, I had a really interesting teacher who took, he saw what I was doing. Because at a young age, I was right doing scores because I would listen to music and, and write. You know, I learned to write. I taught myself. Uh, in a way, by just reading books and looking, observing, and it's just, I got to mention the steel drum was one of the best things I could have played because it taught me about chords. Actually, if I know I want to do F major seven chord, I know the steel pad. Okay, you hold an A and a C, you know, you hold a C and an E, and you hold an F and an A or whatever, and we got a voicing of a certain chord, and you know what the, the you know the root is, and so I know how to put together chords and voice chords. Which was an interesting thing, you know. It's like serendipitously, this this whole thing just grew, and uh, so you know, it, I was able to translate that. So when I'm voicing horns or strings or something, it's just pretty much the same kind of process, you know. It's like a G minor. So oh shucks, if I put like a B flat, the same notes as a B flat major seven, put the G in the bottom, like the, that's like a nine, a G minor. It was so really cool, you know. And you you find out these things. You learn about textures and how to make a voice, certain voice speak. You know, plus a steel drum, something that seemed so simple and primitive, was very, very instrumental in me understanding music theory in itself and how to construct chords and voice things. You know, I had four horns. How do I get the horns to sound big? You know, you learn about dovetailing and making them sound pretty big and wide and open with the brass. So, we, you know, I did. I only had four guys, but sometimes you make them sound really big uh, by voicing them. It's open voicing, you know, this kind of um, thing. But so. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it was very interesting in those days, um, you know, going to this cool school and the teacher took an interest in me and used to give me, just talk to me, I, I would have questions about, you know, theory and harmony and certain things and he would just talk to me and, you know, take me after school and let me check out a, a group playing somewhere and, you know, like they would say, I remember Rosh and Roland Kirk, you know, playing, he said, go down to Carnegie or wherever he's playing, you know and check it out, you know? And this is like, you know, he didn't have to do that. It wasn't part of the curriculum, you know? But he was, he had an interest in what I was doing and kind of believed in what I was doing. And, you know, we remember us playing, you know, in the, in the school band, we played the kid from Red Bank, you know, some bassy tune or whatever. And uh, various tunes, you know, you just get interesting music that we would try to play. And, I, but anyway, I had a, really, a pretty good support system in that way. And as a matter of fact, I was just doing a radio show the other day and they asked me about you know, the advice to the kids and stuff, and I told what, what has changed. Uh, and I was interviewing a, a station in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, and I was talking about the public school system in New York City, how vibrant it was, how, how you know, fantastic it was at that time in, in, in producing these great bands. You know, we had Crown Heights of Fear that came out of, uh, yeah. you know, Brooklyn. We had the whole BT ex Express. A we lot of great jazz A lot of players. great cats, yeah, came out of that. Carlos and that's Garnet. a public school system. You know, and I tell you, there is a connection between what we do as musicians and, you know, it, it's, it does something to the mind. It's a language that's, you know, we're multilingual. 
you know, we could we talk a language that a lot of people can't, you know, get into. You know, we know, let's look, look at the logic involved. If this, then that. I mean, we could change the key to a song. Well, if this is the, if it's an F and it's in the key of C, if you go to uh, the four, the four, we know from the C, it's an F and from B flat, it's an E flat. And we, we could do these translations so quickly in our heads. And that same kind of, uh, that's, that's that whole kind of, that skill can be translated to language and to mathematics and to other other things. You know, it's so funny. Most of the lawyers I know, the guy, they want to be musicians, and the musicians say, "Oh, they wish they could be lawyers." You know, <laughs> it's like the grass is always greener. But I think there's nothing more. I think it's it's wonderful for the mind than the arts, especially music, because I can speak of that, and it's a great exercise for the mind for your thinking, because it's logic involved and a certain kind of reasoning that goes with it and you know you look imagine we look at dots on a piece of paper and we make sense of these little dots there and we could make it talk and make people cry and laugh and move their body we're taking frequencies and just mixing them up in a certain order and form and affecting human emotion this is powerful stuff we have special powers <laughs> you know <laughs> we do <laughs> yeah this is big stuff Politicians only dream about this, to have this kind of power, you know, and that's why sometimes I hear these political ads and, uh, you know, they have the music behind it. It's never without the music. They got to have the little music to pull the emotion because we know how to do that well. We know what notes and frequencies to pull. We, we have the combination. So this is good stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to play, I want to play some of the, the first uh, recordings that you, that you actually worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, not too far out of high school, or maybe right around high school, mm -hmm. you formed uh, the uh, Brass Construction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, I think you can hear your horn arrangement here. Um, it's pretty intense. Mm, uh, we're going to play. Uh, what it is, surprise me. <laughs> I don't know when the last time you heard this one, but let's check it out. Hey, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is your life. I mean, that, I think that was in high school I did this. this, this oh, my God. I, I uh, one thing that's <laughs> it's kind of fun about that track is, like, you seem to be kind of showing your chops off with the, like, uh, making the horn section as crazy as possible. Yeah, that. but, you know, in those days, I think we had a lot of the influences from jazz. I mean, I enjoyed, uh, it's, it's people, people probably not associate this group with funk, and they're not a funk group, but I love the horns. As a matter of fact, one of the, pro the things that early on in my, my um, if you listen to very, my very first album, the, the, the Move-In, the album with Move-In, um, the lyrics is very smart. We just sang like hooks and a little change. I just love, just the, I, I was not into lyrics that much. Um, this track, um, in those days, I think I used to like, um, that's before, that's during the time of Chicago. I think Chicago was around. Mm -hmm. I love the group Chicago. They're not a funk group, but I love the stair horn work. Chicago, blood, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, very hot. The Tower of Power, I think, was uh, right. Come on, yeah. yeah, and I think Mandrill mm -hmm. was a was very, very influential. I enjoyed Mango Meat and all those kind of songs from Mandrill. Uh, so those days, you had to, you know, you had to show you had your chops. And the drummer, there's a couple of licks, certain licks the drummer had to play. You had to go. That was like the. That's the. You gotta do that. Yeah, you gotta do your little thing. But um, yeah, horns. You know, I just wanted to. I love glaring horns. I like the stuff. I like the power of it. You know. And around this time, did it, was that when you met Jeff Lane? Yeah, I met him when I was in high school. And yeah, and can yeah. you explain sort of who he was or Jeff was what a, he a did? local uh, producer who had a, who was actually forming a, a you know a little production company, and uh, one of the guys went to school with his daughter. I think Morris went to school with his daughter, and he told you know, told me about this guy, and he wanted to meet me because I was doing you know, our band was getting pretty hot around the neighborhood. We were getting a little local name. We were playing all the, the gigs, and in those days, Brooklyn had a wonderful infrastructure for live bands. I mean, you go down the street, you know, there's a club here. You know, I would go during the week because I was the guy that pretty much tried to get the gigs. You go tell him about your band. The guy says, okay, come in Thursday. We'll give you a try. You know, no pay. You go, you play, and they like you. It's okay. We'll book you for Saturday or whatever, and you come in. And but you would get gigs. You know, there's not enough places we could get fine work. Uh, sometimes I remember telling people that the band, uh, what turned out to be Brass Construction, we would actually 
we had no cars because all of us were young. We didn't have a driver's license. We would actually take the band on the train, New York City subway. We take our drum set. The whole band would go to the gig on the train. Yes. <laughs> we would take the train and, you know, all your boys will come with you. They'll help you carry the whole drum. And at that time, we have amplifiers, too. You had to carry the custom amplifier. I think it was custom. We take the roller custom amplifier in the train. And the whole thing, it was like, it was crazy. I would look back, I go like, I don't believe we did this. But that was it. Um, until we got big time and we all would fit in one van and go to the gig. Now, even if you bring your girlfriend, you got to squeeze her in. And we all in the back of the van. And because some people want to come, they don't want to pay to get into the dance or the party. So they'll come with the band, like, I'm with the band, you know, that, that, that whole line. So we'll pack everyone in. They'll help us lift. So you want to come with us, you got to help us lift the stuff. And we'll pack into the van. But um, yeah, Jeff um, was a local uh, producer, you know, starting. And, and uh, I guess he heard about what we're doing. And, you know, the guy was, Marsh was going to, I think, going to school with his daughter. And so I met him. And he was doing gospel music. Um, he was doing, you know, some church type of things. Uh, there was a guy, um, what was his name? Nat Kennedy. Um, and he did these really, I can't look back and say it was hokey uh, gospel stuff, but in those days you look back and say, wow, we actually did that. He did songs like, um, with lyrics where, you know, uh, he was having a bad day and he's um, walking down the street, everything bad happens to him and, the, you know, a bird, some droppings fell on him. And so the line, the lyric goes, I'm so glad a damn cow can't fly. Because <laughs> you can imagine what would happen. Anyway, um, but we did. I did some stuff with uh, with Jeff, and uh, I had a fun, lot of fun. I learned some things while working with him. I uh, we went to the studio, and um, there was an engineer called John Bradley. We worked um, on many albums together. The, the first, most of the earlier brass things, NBT things, we worked. But Jeff was, um, and I learned a lot of things in the studio about just you know. <clears throat> Uh, in those days, it was 16 track, and the whole record is done in 16 track studio. And um, uh, you know, learning how to you know we group the stuff together, and you know they bounce a lot of bouncing. You put the horns, you bounce everything. You do, and then you do the drums, and you mix the drums down. Can you explain uh, what what bouncing oh is? If anyone God. doesn't know. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So you combine the tracks. Let's say you have you have uh, 16 tracks, but you got you know things that. Like, 20 different things you have to put down, but you only have 16 tracks, or, you know, or let's say, yeah, 16 tracks. So what we'll do, let's say we have vocals, the guy does like three, well, says we didn't do that much, you know, uh, today is so small, we have like 10 tracks of drums or 15 tracks of drums. But those days, if the drums will go, maybe you have the kick separate, kick stand and everything else. So drums will be at two tracks, two, yeah, maybe two, sometimes just one track. But, you know, it's like you have two. You have the kick and one, the stand, and everything else, right? So maybe three tracks for the drums. It's stereo. And then if a push comes to shove, we'll mix it down. Um, we'll take, uh, combine everything, get it sounding where we, the way we want it in the record, and then make it permanent on one track. So now it frees up the other tracks that we're taking up the space, right? So if you have four horns and you, you know, play the horns twice, it takes up eight tracks because, like, you know, Four horns, and you, 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 you know, maybe you just blend them in and do one track, set a track of horns and another set. Then you bounce them down to how you think it should be sounding in the, in the record. So you, you, you balance them, okay, more trumpet, more this, but they'll be like that permanently. And that's basically what the bouncing. You're taking multiple tracks and funneling them down to one or so, right? So that you bounce that way. Thing with bouncing, you do a lot of bouncing, you get hiss, tape hiss, right? We get a lot of hiss, so you try not to do too much of that. And that kind of thing is just isn't an issue anymore. Today, today. no, it's not something you, you know. You just you have enough tracks to do anything. And sometimes I think, you know, it's great, but I and and it 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 helps with the experimental aspect in in, in producing and composing. But uh, sometimes, you know, I look and I I see sometimes guys with like eight tracks of you know like twenty tracks of drums and stuff. And in the old days, you had to get it right early on. So pretty much, you come out plan. You plan everything. That's why you know being literate and doing charts and stuff was important. You plan. You know what what it should sound like, what it should be, and you went in with a set agenda. Today, it's more like I see it's more free form. Like, hey, this is what I'm feeling. I'm not feeling that kick right now. I'm gonna change the kick. I'm gonna put you know something else and uh, put another one under it. You know, get a loop going, etc. 
And we had nothing like that in the old days, you know. Whatever it was, that's it, man. You sing it down, you do it, a couple of punches, that's it. It's over. So you have to know what you're doing. You, you, you just have to know. So it's a little more, you know, strategic, uh, you know, kind of a strategic approach in production. So it, it's very different than today where you say, I changed my mind, I don't like it. Even the tempo. You couldn't change tempo in those days like that. Now you go like, you know what, it's 120, I'll make it like 123, you know, and stuff like that. 125, I'll make it up there, I'll bring it down a little bit. No. You went in it, the tempo is it. And of course the tempo goes up and down, you know, the drummer may get excited and it'll go up and then come down. But that's how it was. So there's a permanence to your work and you have to know what you're doing, you know. So, you, the, so guys, and also when we do records, you would do like five songs in a session, you're like, boom. Remember, there's another component here an advantage that you have. In those days, you had live players. You had to pay these guys. If we want to have strings on a record was big time. Because these are union guys, you know. These, you know, these serious musician guys come in. And you can't just say, look, yo, give me a little bit, you know, go like this, ta-ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta-ta. So you have to get charts written out, you know, and you have to know what the hell you're doing. Because these guys are looking at the clock. It's double time after time, union, and, you know, you got to pay them. And it brings up the budget of your project and your record. So you really have to know what you do. Planning, the arranger was uh, very key. And it was more, more important, I think, then. Now, you know, you hear something, you know what, I, I'll think, you know what, I'll, I'll use a JV 1080, I'll do the strings. No, nah, I'll, I'll take a sample from someplace, I'll change my mind, I don't want it to take the strings, turn it into horn, or whatever. So you have this kind of, it's good. It's good, there's another plus, uh, there's value to that as well. But the other, the other way, you know, it has its, uh, both ways have its, its charm, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting back to Jeff, what he did, yeah. you, he basically brought you in brought me into to work the, on brought, arrangements. Is that's that right? right. Brought, actually, you know, I never did string arrangements before in my life until Jeff says, Muller, need some string on this track tomorrow. Uh, no, it was like, this is Monday, like Wednesday. I want some string on this. I, I know what the hell, I never did string, I did horns. He go. You're smart, you'll find out. Wednesday, uh, just tell me how many vi what you need. So that time I was in school, I go, oh my God, I, I don't know how to do this. What am I gonna, how the hell am I gonna do this? So I went to my professor, I went to the teacher and says, uh, you know, tell me about the violin. She said, what do you wanna know? She, I, she said, I said, please tell me about the violin. And she said, well, you know, she told me about the clef and you know, you got the C clef and you could do this and blah, blah, blah for the violas and, you know, the string. And it sounds like this on the piano if you write it here. And I remember that. And I go, okay. So I remember I was in school and I, I just, I said, I'm going to be embarrassed because he said, okay, what do you need? I said, okay, give me um, five islands, two violas. I don't know what I'm talking. I'm making this stuff as I'm going, right? I don't know what I was doing. I just, like, did that. So now I have to write the charts. He gave me the stuff and... I just sat, I had no piano, I didn't write it with a piano. Most of the things I did, you know, I was getting some ear training, and you know, a little solfege in those days, you know, you know, do re mi fa so and all that kind of stuff. And I remember writing, that's what, for the um, gospel stuff, you know, doing the charts. I got a guy from school, actually, the first guy, and it was Jeffrey Steinhurst, I think, or something like that. Jeffrey, anyway, Jeffrey, you know, I got some guys from the music department to bring their violin down to play this stuff. And so I wrote the stuff out. It's like guesswork. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I wrote it out, and we went and we did the song, and I put the track on. I, you know, conduct the thing. I started to sound good. It's not like what I had in my head. I go, yes, this is so cool. So I was like, I was, I don't know what the, what would, of course, like, what the hell? I need to say it nicely. I didn't know what would have uh, happened. You know, what would come out, and um, it was so cool. I said yes, and I started correlating. Okay. So if that's that, and I started to develop the language of writing. And it was interesting, as a matter of fact, the song Express. I remember doing that song, and uh, Jeff Ginn said, listen, I need stuff, this BT Express, I want you know, some strings on this stuff. And I, would, I remember writing it and um, sitting at my grandmother's table, and without a piano, and I hear it in my head, I go, da -da 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 -da. and that's why you hear those string parts are so simple. It, it, it express goes da -da 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 It's so simple because you know, first of all, it's without the, the benefit of uh, the all the piano for all that harmonic stuff. Uh, but the interesting thing about that, I wasn't finished. He's outside my house blowing his horn, 
eh, eh, let's go. We got to go to the studio. I wasn't finished. So that's why I just made simple little lines. And that's how the track came out. And it ended up being like a gold album or whatever it was. <laughs> so BT Express was, was more like a, a funk band. But yeah, this BT was, was I think, what, 75? 72. 70, 72? Yeah, 72, 73, yeah. 73. Okay, so, yeah. so he had this idea that he's yeah, he, going to put strings yeah, on the, on the funk, that kind over, of thing. over this thing. Yeah. Kind of uh, unusual concept. That's right. For that time, but, it was very different. You know, the, the boy genius mm -hmm. can... Can invent a, a I string. Know what I was doing. String section. So okay, let's listen to the the thing you came up with while he was beeping his horn uh, at your so grand, at the grandmother's table, house. Right? I don't know. I just made it up. So you hear how it sounds. I mean, you know, it's how simple it is. Huge, huge smash, right? Yeah, that was uh, very, very uh, big for BT. Yeah. yeah. And and the other the other crazy thing is that that song kicked off a whole style of groups from around the world who suddenly wanted to put string sections uh, on their, on their, uh, their, well, their so-called That's true. You know, I funk. think Silver Convention uh, came. Because uh, before, it's funny. There's a thing we call the fall-off. The string goes, mm -hmm. meow, that, that whole sound. I don't think anyone did it. Because I, I kind of like serendipitously, you know, kind of, just, I kind of stumbled into it because I was used to doing horns. I want a horn blast, and I just wrote this thing on the paper, like a little thing with a little line down, and I saw the guy just go like that. And uh, it became sort of one of my, you know, uh, musical rigidities. Okay, uh, check, check yeah. out the, see if you guys can hear. So, so there you were, not really knowing what you were doing and writing, no, I made it all writing uh, uh, <laughs> strings that sounded like horns. Yeah. And then the song becomes a huge hit. You've got people around the world who are like, oh, wow, we've got to copy that, that <laughs> string sound. But I think that's what the whole musical thing is. There is this kind of interchange and exchange. We talk to each other you know, over oceans and you know, just defying geography. And there is this whole network that goes on. And we do that now. I mean, this is part of music. We, we're part of the, so, the times. I think we were saying something new then. And it's always a, sort of like a Darwinian process where the best ideas and best things surface. And people go, oh, that's cool. And someone grabs it. You run with it. It becomes almost like public property. You know? So we can't say, no, I'll just do a cool beat. Nobody else do my beat. It's going to go out in the main. And uh, so there is that kind of. The industry protecting itself, you know, they say, okay, we like that. And, you know, it's a compliment, I think, for people to kind of just like, you know, they want to, to me, I thought I'm flattered that, you know, someone steals something of mine in this style or whatever. So I think music, that's what it's about in, in a way. We speak to each other. I mean, there's so much cross-pollination that goes on uh, that, you know, I think it's beautiful. That's all. Uh, talking about the cross-pollination, I want to play uh, another big brass construction song um, that probably everybody has heard before. Well, it's funny. In those days, we didn't think of sampling. We didn't think, you know, we weren't thinking legalistically in those days, you know. And we never even thought about it. You know, we didn't think about it. Uh, but, it, you know, in retrospect, you do see the similarities, you know. Um, but today, you know, the publishers would have had a great big battle about that one. It's very, very similar. So, um, did uh, I heard a rumor that Motown wanted to sign Brass Construction at one point? Well, it's actually the old days. I remember getting phone calls. It was the Joe Bett division, the publishing division, and um, yeah, actually, I still have the contract in my house. I signed the contract, but I never mailed it in because I changed my mind. Uh, all the guys, we we actually signed it. Um, had it ready to, to mail out, and my vibe just said no. Um, they would send us, you know, they were very interested in um, what we were doing, and um, uh, we were, had a very different sound at the time. They had the group Rare Earth happening during that time within the stable, and they wanted to get, you know, another kind of horn funk band. And um, so I would get phone calls at my school. You get the phone number at the phone booth, and they'd call me, like, be at the phone booth at 2 o'clock, you know, in between classes or something. And they would talk to me, and they would send me songs. 
Um, I think they were more interested in, in getting covers of their, their catalog, you know, us re um, recording some of their things. But yes, there was um, that whole thing about, you know, I guess things would have been different. I don't know how different it would have been. But um, yes, I remember we, they were sent contracts, and I never, we signed it, never turned it in. And we ended up going to um, United Artists in the, in the end. And your, your songs at that time were instrumentals. Yeah, mostly instrumentals, and I got to say, uh, Jeff kind of pushed me to put words to it because j basically, I was, uh, you know, an instrumental kind of guy. I knew no words to no song. I just loved the music part. I mean, I, I remember even listening to later on all the stuff from Tom Bell. You know, he's great. I think most brilliant, brilliant arranger. But I could sing like some of the Motown things. I could sing like the third cello part. You know, I know all the the third trumpet part or the trombone part. I would listen that closely to the records just to, you know, because I just I like to hear what's going on back there. Uh, but then, you know, there was uh, Jefferson, you know, let's add some words to these songs. It, it makes it more commercial and more happening. So I sat there and came up with these, you know. As you notice, the first time I did um, the brass albums, they're all verbs, like moving, changing, talking, dancing. It was all <laughs> verbs, you know. Um, uh, you know, we had this kind of theme that ran through all the songs because I just made up these Okay, um, sitting, that's it. <laughs> now, I would like to sit here and tell you I had great d deliberation about my music. It's deep. But no, it's very spontaneous. And uh, I think that's what makes it fun. Um, you know, but yeah, um, <laughs> that's it. So, so uh, around this time, the, the vibe of what was popular in music was sort of changing. And you can hear on those early records, 75, the, the four on the floor, uh, kick yeah. is coming in as yeah. opposed to the syncopated. Yeah, well, what happened? Earlier. It was interesting. It, there was a change because, the, you know, you had the Motown sound where they had that very slick kind of polished um, thing going on. You know, they had great arrangements, the guys who did the stuff there. But so I think with Brass and BT, we were the first kind of bands to take that street funk. Yeah, it's like if James Brown had strings, you know what I'm saying? We took the, the rawness of the street and just merged it with this kind of polish of, you know, the, the arrangement, the strings and the fancy horns, um, you know, and, and the strings, I think, was a more revolutionary element. And it's funny because in the first album, there's a song called Changing. And what I would do, a lot of the arrangement, because I was learning at that time, I was still in school learning all, you know, technique and, and theory and all that, it's a song called Changing. And I remember learning of a thing called contrary motion, you know, and theory, I go, wow. So, so I would take all the homeworks and pretty much practice them on the songs the album. So I said, okay, displacement, I'll take this and shift it here. And I would do all these little techniques that I learned in class, maybe the same day, and go write the chart and put these, you know, incorporate these techniques into my arrangements. Uh, so in change, I like change it a lot because, you know, I, messed, I was messing around with all sorts of stuff in that song, you know, using all the, you know, the country and more displacements and all these kind of uh, techniques. Uh, um, Shall we uh, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. give it a listen yeah. and, okay. and maybe you can maybe you can point out what Thank you. Yeah. We basically um, the way we did it basically um, uh, we did the, the um, rhythm track you know the bass with the bass drums guitar uh, keyboards we would do our stuff and uh, did a, you know we'd probably if, we'd have rehearsals at the in the basement and do some of the parts. And, but sometimes in the studio, we would change stuff, so I would shift things around. Uh, because the vibe, if it's really groove in a studio, I would just let it groove, and then you write more stuff around it. Uh, that was the way it was done, you know. Um, did, you, did you punch in stuff or do a lot yeah, of Yeah, we did a lot of punching, you know. We did a little, Muhammad Ali would be proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> we did so much punching. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's... Um, it was a vibe thing, you know, the way, the, I think the, sen the essence in a lot of these tracks is like, we did it bottom up, the rhythm tracks had to be pumping, you know, the, ma the main thing is those ry the rhythm tracks had to be happening, otherwise we wouldn't even bother with the track, you know, yeah, in those days, I love, I'm a frustrated bass player, I love the bass, you notice all the songs, you have these single, these bass lines, that, you know, these ostinatos that keep going, um, and you just ride around them, you know, because uh, I, I think, just even with the simplicity of the lyrics, you know, in a way I look back and said, you know, it's good. Sometimes less is more. The abstraction itself engages people. People let it take it to mean whatever they want. Uh, it's like a commercial. They say a lot, but they say, they say nothing, 
you know. Uh, but during those times, it was very significant because we had the war going on, right? Uh, you know, we had we had a lot of stuff going on socially. You know, times are changing. I think for the black community, it was a big thing. The civil rights thing was happening. We had this all power. You know, the, the, the youth, everyone was like, you know, at the time, it was just, let's see, what we had, uh, was it, no, Nixon was out, right? Was I trying to remember? 75? Yeah, yeah. We had, we had a lot of stuff going on in, here in the United States, I think globally. Um, and the, 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 what work, I think, helped these tracks to, to, to kind of resonate around the world because we didn't get a very static kind of lyric, you know, just to say times are changing was like, in, in this kind of context, it, was, it just has a certain power to it. You know, got myself together and I'm moving on. Remember, guys, you know, in, in the, civil, the whole civil rights thing and people trying to get empowered, that was, that was big. You know, people had something, a little hook, an anthem they could identify with. And uh, so it's, it's, it seems very simple and trite, but it, it, you have to put it in a social context. These, these, these hooks and what happened, I think, Moving was one of the biggest songs we've done, and it still, you know, gets a lot of play. You know, I see, you know, the, the ASCAP and BMI stuff. Um, you know, it's still somehow, especially today, the, the, you know, we're going through a change socially again, politically around the world. Uh, and you know, I think we need some of this kind of stuff to happen, uh, you know, musically um, as well. It's interesting advice for lyric writers, less in this case Sometimes was definitely good. more because people yeah. could kind of apply their own uh, context to, to the concept that you put out in the song. Sometimes you could say, you know, one word could have a lot of power, you know. Uh, you know, it's just not where you, because you, you put 300 words, it means more than one word, you know. I think the beauty of one word, we have these kind of levels of abstraction. People could, you know, you know, if I say, um, you know, happiness, what does that mean to you? You know, happiness, right? I mean, we all have a concept of what's, what's going to make us happy, you know? And you could write probably a 200-page essay or, okay, 10-page essay on, you know, happiness. It's one stupid word. And so, you know, we have to look at it in that, in that way. Yeah, and I think... Do you think the same thing could be applied to music in terms of complexity in in musical expression? Ah, oh, well, that's a deep question, man. Because um, today I see, you know, with the loops and stuff, you get a one-bar loop, and we're doing a lot of stuff with one-bar loops and two-bar loops, and you know, we just change the ornamentation is what's you know happening there, and just we're dealing with um, sonic spaces and you know, just like colors and textures. We want just a pastiche of sound that we're doing now. We'll just get a, a raggedy sounding drum beat and then put something else with it and we're mixing, making these kind of musical gumbo today. I think it's just as powerful. Um, you know, I like what's happening today in a way with music. A lot of great things are happening. You know, I know a lot of the old guys, oh man, they don't make music like they used to. And the guys before them thought they were making music like they used to. You know, and I think this is, Part of the, it comes with the territory. It's, it's, it's not a static kind of thing, enterprise you're in. We react to what's happening in society, and society is never sits still. We're, we're a product of our times. You know, like I was just thinking the other day, someone asked me, who are you, to, you know, who are you, you know? And I just, part of my definition of self is like, I'm a product of all the movies and radio, I listen to all the songs, you know? I'm a, I'm a, media, I'm a, media, I'm a product of my media experience. You know, I'm a product of the music I heard, the Calypso music back then. I'm a product of James Brown, you know. I'm a product of Aretha Franklin and, you know, Duke Ellington and a Mighty Sparrow. You know, all these, imagine, I just took all these people and put them in one space and they speak, you know, and they come up with something new, you know. So it's interesting today, you know, the society, you see, what's happening here, if you don't have to get deep about it, but the same revolution that we're seeing and changes we see happening in, in music now is happening in art. It's even happening in politics. You know, everyone goes for the sound bite. You know, you could say you know, it's using certain kind of icons to express greater ideas. You know, uh, we have our own, you know, we're using the icons. We use little, little samples and we just do it. And that sound brings a certain emotional emotion to the song. Sometimes you want something to sound grainy and scraggly. It's too clean. It's no good. It's like using film 
versus video. Right? There's a difference in something, how something looks if you use video uh, versus films. As if using color or black and white. Maybe it's the same object, but if we put them in a certain kind of space, the, the emotional response becomes very different. So as producers and writers, you think about these things and you make decisions as to how you will express your thoughts and ideas. And uh, I think what's good about today is that we have so many tools, we have access. It's like having a larger alphabet. You know, we have 26 letters that we use and we have all these words. So imagine the colors we could paint with in terms, we have a greater, a larger, a, a more, a wider palette with which to paint, you know, and express ourselves. So we become more precise in our, we could be more precise in our expressions. We're having more. We said, we want green. Well, exactly that green. You want a certain type of green. And we could actually do that today. Go in almost like surgically and just get our ideas more precise how we want it. We don't want that. We don't want it to be 20 beats, you know, per minute. We want 20 and a half beats. <laughs> we could just go like that and pretty much be a little more, you know, we, we, we could now speak you know, with more precision, I think, musically and artistically. That's the good thing about what's happening now. Technology also gives, listen, the old days, if I had an idea, a song idea, I had to have money to, 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 to make it, to manifest it, to make it happen. Because I didn't have, there were no string synthesizers. String, you know, in the old days, a piano was a piano. You had a big thing in a house, or you have to have physical space to have this stuff happen, right? Today, you could stay in a small space and produce just big sounding music, you know? So there was no, there was no economic barrier in that sense. You know, in the old days, I want strings. I had to pay big time union guys to come in and play, really, to get a real professional sounding string. Now we could do amazing things. Uh, with, with, you know, sampling and all the different tools we have now. Uh, so I, th I think it's, it's, it's really brilliant um, what's happening. The old music is great. Uh, you know, it has its charm as well, you know. But it's like saying, well, all the good films were made back in the 1960s or, you know, all the great filmmakers died. There's no one, you know, we're not making great films. You know, we're doing great things visually now as well. And, you know, so I'm getting back to the whole thing of the music, the voice, artistic voice, you know. We see changes in art, how things, you know, it's like going from, uh, you know, um, uh, who should, should I go back to? Michelangelo to, to Picasso, you know, everyone has their, you know, to Peter Max in the 60s or whatever. Um, they all have, you know, th their charm. You know, we can't say, oh, this new time, this... You know, Peter Max said, oh, Van Gogh and those guys are terrible. Or, oh, and then Van Gogh would tell Peter Max, oh, you're terrible. You don't know how to draw a straight image or whatever. Uh, Picasso, your stuff is all twisted, you know. Um, there's, <laughs> there's different ways of expressing things. And so we have this shift in visually. We also have this, um, what's going on sonically. We also have it even the political front, the kind of how we, what we expect of politicians, our public speakers, our public people, they now talk to us in using certain symbolism. Well, I don't know if it's, I think it's kind of lazy, but that's what's happening as well. In so many aspects of, us, of our lives, we see this kind of the connection. So it's not a static thing. So when they say, I'm going back to the original uh, point I was making about, you know, it's, all, it's you know, good music back then and today. Um, we have, you know, you, we, you're responding, you're a product of your, your, your media experiences and what, you know, what's inside of you, and you're speaking, you know, through all that. And uh, so that's it. That's what you are and who you are. So, and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, what you're saying about being a product of your media experiences, mm -hmm. for a lot of us, uh, many of our media experiences as far as music go were informed by the stuff that came out in the late 70s, disco, etc. And many of those arrangements came uh, from you. Some of the, some of the great songs, uh, club tracks in New York in the 70s and early 80s. You filtered your uh, Mighty Sparrow and yeah. Duke Ellington <laughs> down, and then you came out with something, and now those, those songs have entered our collective consciousness mm -hmm. and are in some way, whether we know it or not, informing the music that that we make, whether we're reacting uh, against it mm -hmm. or, or, or working with it. 
Yeah, well, the thing, I think, this is not a philosophy class or anything like that, but, you know, um, as human beings, I think we have this thing where we, we, we like to have maps. We need something to guide us, you know. I think, like, I always say, it's like, we're like, you know, we have to have an operating system, you know, and, you know, then we have different applications, but we have to have a certain type of operating system to make sense of what's around us. And uh, we don't like to be without maps. We love maps. We like to know what to do. Like sometimes we have religion to explain the thing, the inexplicable sometimes. You know, like, yeah, that's why the mountain is doing, the gods are angry, that's why. You know, then another guy comes and, no, it's not the gods, whatever. But we need to understand what's going on around us. And so we have maps. So in music, the same thing. You know, you have to have, I like to think that I did this all on my own, you know. But look, I had a, look, the guy, George, I was supposed to leave, a lot of people say, oh, it was a useless old man just playing, drunk, playing the flute. But look, he informed me in a in certain way. And up to now, I'm an adult, you know, guy going on in the numbers in his age. And George is speaking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still carrying George's voice. This is so cool, you know. But so the trick is now to trying to get good maps, which we could follow, you know. Get the kind of maps, you know, get, get solid maps, you know. Um, so you know, you figure it's like, what is a solid map? What's a good map? You know, we, we take a certain chance, but you know, we, we try. I I think that's the trick is to try. I try to listen to a variety of music. You know, you know, I just don't stick to my local hip hop station. I I listen to all sorts of stuff, and um, you know, I'm doing a smooth jazz album. I just did a smooth jazz album. It's like very different than the stuff we just heard. You know, I'm doing some hip hop stuff. I did, I'm doing some relaxed music, just like birds and ocean and sounds, you know, uh, you know, using atmosphere and all this stuff in that program. Uh, you know, so from that to the, the atmosphere stuff is a it's pretty vast, it's pretty wide uh, spectrum, you know. Well, I don't know stuff about... Stuff with no kick drum. It, wait a second. No kick drum. No kick no, drum. No, wait a minute. <laughs> I need the kick drum, Okay. <laughs> Um, and I want to talk about some stuff with the heavy kick drum, and, and let's get off the, the f philosophy uh, cloud for a minute, mm -hmm. and let's talk about some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I want to talk about is uh, after you had some big success, chart success with Brass Construction, you were touring around. Uh, can you tell us about some of your experiences when you met the Carries, uh, or the... Oh. The Sal Soul Prelude, those days, Patrick Adams, Peter Brown, Midtown Manhattan. There were an incredible number of amazing dance records coming out That's at right. that time. And a lot of that stuff was centered in a pretty small nucleus of, of players. Uh, can you, can you kind of take us through that scene and what that oh was like. Uh, I mean, it well, was, was Studio exciting. 54, the Paradise yeah, Garage. Yeah, it was very, very exciting times. I mean, I remember being in the city doing sessions and the musicians, just great guys. You come out of the session, you see this, you know, Patrick Adams is in this room and I'm, you know, another guy's in this room. Uh, it was just good stuff happening then. And it's funny how I met the Carries, Ken Carey, the guys who own Sal Soul Records, uh, because I just took my, my, my savings, my life savings, and decided I'm gonna record this group called Sky. And I remember cutting the album because I, you know, I did a lot of it when I was traveling with brass on the road. I would come back and record at night or whatever and get a cheap rate because, you know, didn't have the budget fully. And um, record the group. And, um, you know, anyway, I, I, I tried to shop it and I got turned down. I, went like, I don't know. We're not hearing it. You know, we're not hearing it. And I remember I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, my girlfriend at that time was like, oh my God, I lost everything, right? My life savings in this group and nobody's buying it. It was horrible. So I remember one day just sitting there and going, no. So I went and got the Billboard magazine and the cash box. And I looked and see, you know, the hot labels and I saw Salso. So I figured, well, okay, Monday I'm going to go and meet, find these Salso people and, you know, I'm going to get a deal. I swear to God, I'm going to do this. So, and that's still, in my head, that's what I was thinking, but, you know, it's strange how it worked out, because I remember doing a session the following week, and I, one guy said, hey, let's go at this guy's place, and, you know, they, it's all, all the producers hang out there, and all the musicians hang out there, Patrick Adams, uh, you know, used to be there, um, uh, the guys from the Philly guys, uh, Norman Harris, the guitar player, all the, the cats were there, 
Uh, to me, it was like big guys. I mean, you know, I was new in the business, relatively speaking. And I went there, and I, and I walked in, and the guy says, oh, this is the guy. This is the kid, you know. Anyway, long story short, that's where I met Ken Carey, the guy who owns South Soul Records, the company I said I'm going to try to make a deal with. And the Ken walked up to me and go like, oh, my God, I've been trying to, you know, we're looking for you. You know, it was like, well, you know, because I never, I didn't go out that much. I was always busy in the studio. And, uh, you know, so it was funny. So he approached me and started talking. I said, well, I so happen to have this group, this thing. He says, so come by the office, whatever. And, um, you know, the rest is history. You know, I did get a deal with Sky, and we made several albums with them. But it was really exciting times, you know, um, uh, during that time. Music was alive, you know, the live session. I mean, I recorded at Blank Tape Studios, and uh, you got Larry LeVan doing his thing. And, you know, the gar Paradise Garage was big. You can, know. You, can you tell them about how, uh, what it was like going to the garage? And did you oh. actually, <laughs> did, you, did you ever bring unfinished stuff there? To yeah, well, we used to take, yeah, I would uh, like make records and sometimes have just like the, you know, we, we'll just do a little, make a little plate of it and so we'll test it out in the club and check it out, all right? You take the, the acetate over there. And uh, I would go and Larry the Van, the guys would be playing, and sometimes they will say, you got to wait till later on in the set. You're not going to play the new stuff early on. They got to get the crowd right. So I would have to stay there till like 3, 4 in the morning. And I'm in the booth. And, you know, it's really cool. Everyone's coming in. All the cool DJs that, you know, wow, these guys are so cool. I'm, I'm standing there. And uh, I didn't used to like to hang out late at night like that, you know. But just for my record, I wanted to see the, the crowd react. And I would just stay there just to get my record played. And uh, I remember, you know, <laughs> There's some very, very friendly guys in the booth, and you know, guys came up to me. And the garage is kind of an open, free place, free spirit kind of place. And I'm hanging out there, and the guy comes up and, you know, embraced me, tried to <laughs> embrace me and stuff. But this was a really cool DJ guy. I didn't want to insult him or anything like that. So if you stand there, you try and engage, engage the best you could. But it was the garage was a great place for fresh music because we had a, a DJ called Frankie Crocker in New York who was, that was the hottest DJ. He broke records. I think he's very much responsible, uh, and, you know, responsible for, you know, success of brass and all those, you know, brass and a lot of the salsa product, a lot of the, the, the music at that time. Because, you know, radio at that time didn't go through all the research and, you know, focus group stuff. They're like, they like it. People are hearing it in the clubs. This is what's happening. Um, you know, play it. And, you know, that's it. It was a bottom-up kind of approach. Uh, so the garage was one of those places where, you know, if it's hot at the garage and stuff, he would just put it on. We had guys like Sylvester uh, coming up during that time. So Frankie, Frankie was also hanging out in the booth. Frankie, everyone, yeah. And he, everybody. Would, he would watch, he would, he would see the reaction of, to, to what the new records that That's Larry right. was playing. That's right. And if it was hot, he would turn around and take it, and the next week you'd hear it on the radio. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was a great uh, testing ground for new stuff, and um, I, I think uh, you know a lot of wonderful things came out of there. So did you did you ever make changes to your songs based on? Yeah, if you hear like the, oh the, the the kick is not loud enough, or you know you need to bring up the you know the, the guitar or whatever, um, you know you hear how it translates on the system, and you try to uh, make the adjustments. You go back and adjust it. Sometimes it sounds really good. You don't touch it. You go right away to press and just press it just like that. Mm -hmm. So I want to I wanna play one of the tracks from Sky. Uh, and I wonder if maybe afterwards you could tell us a little bit about this song and, and okay. how it came to be. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a blast from the past. I gotta say that that's that's got to be a masterpiece. That's right a blast there. from the past. Um, <laughs> what what can you tell us about making that making that record? There's ah, oh, that record is a special record to me. Um, first of all, it's a, it's a very positive record. That was about my girlfriend, my wife actually at the time, and uh, <laughs> it was a great um, uh, you know. Just a positive thing. But what's interesting about that, first of all, some great musicians. Sky, I mean, is one of the best rhythm sections I've worked with. I think the Sky guys are great. Tommy on drums, Solomon, great guitarist, and Denise with that sound. Um, she just 
became the sound of the group. And now, the um, interesting thing about her, that was the first song. This yeah, you know, Denise used to be, you know, Denise was like the, the, the third harmony background singer in the group, you know, the three sisters that were doing, it was, you know, comprised of the, the, the vocal, the, the female, you know, the singing part of Sky. And um, prior to that, we featured, you know, her sister had a very smoother, softer voice. And I remember hearing Denise's uh, tone. I go like, why is she singing lead? And so this song I wrote to feature the very first song, which features her in that very strong lead role and went on to be the sound of the group. Um, you know, but uh, as I said, Gerald, Gerald, the bass player, is a really cool guy. Gerald LeBond, really, really hot. Um, and Tommy, I enjoyed working with the group. I mean, they're just great musicians. They, uh, I did stuff with, Raphael, with Cameron. All of the Cameron stuff, I used uh, the Sky Rhythm section. We became like a unit. We did, you know, most of the tracks together. So we had like a, a thing in the studio. The way I record most of those tracks, um, i very spontaneous, uh, but I still like a structure. So what I would do, I would sit on the roads. Um, I generally play the keyboards. And um, I'll have a mic. And um, you know everyone has their can, and they will play, and they have to, they know that I generally don't like the group, the singers, to know the song too much in advance. I don't want them to know the song. I would go and just sit with her and just get a sense of the key, make sure her voice is in the right range. But I don't want, I don't like the vocalist to know the track too well. I don't want it sounding too rehearsed. She sounded pretty, you know, like you believe her when she was singing a bit. So that's how I got, the, I get that kind of thing. I don't like the, I don't like to, to rehearsals and vocals too much. Not too much rehearsing. But the guys, I'll give them an outline, I'll give them a bass line so we can get the, the, the feel and hone it. Not too much rehearsing either, and we go in the studio. And I would have the chart mapped out, and I would, you know, give instructions over the cans. Okay, symbols here, bam, go, let's go. Okay, watch out, we're going to make this. And we're just talking, and we're just, we're rocking, and it just comes out, you know, pretty spontaneous. You could hear the life in the track. You know, I get excited, the drumming, we all work together, and it, everything locks. It just it gets a great chemistry. And, uh, but the musician, those guys are really great, I got to say. The Sky guys are really fantastic. But that's a, that's a great, a really cool, happy track that I think, you know, was very, very, um, uh, um, I guess it, it was memorable, for, you know, to me for Denise's performance of that, on that record. Mm -hmm. You mentioned how uh, you started using Sky, the the band, yeah, so rhythm the section, rhythm section yeah. on other projects. So yeah. you were getting, you were getting other work at this time, uh, yeah, writing and arranging. Yeah, I did stuff with uh, Tomiko Jones. I think we used them, and like I said, I used it for Cameron. Um, uh, they were just a good. We were just a good unit. We locked well. Uh, Tommy is an excellent drummer. Great feel. And after a while, they know what I like. You know, if you notice, most of my records, I hit my cymbals on the second beat of the measure. I like to, psh, I always like, even in my, <laughs> I have this, something about that, that two that I like. I, I just put the crash cymbal on the two. And it just gives a certain kind of signature and effect that it just pushes the beat a bit more. So one, I go for two. Two, right, and it just, something about it. But you hear it. So he knew my hits. He knew how I like, you know, the drums to flow. And uh, we just had a good kind of language together. Mm -hmm. Did, were these the same guys that played on the Charles Erlen? Yeah, stuff? that's right. We played on Charles Erlen as well. Um, um, what was the name of the song? Um, Let the music, the music play. play. I to uh, yeah. I w we'll hear just a little bit of that, but I want I want you to tell them about when you were rehearsing oh. to make this. <laughs> yeah. Let the music. Now, play. I totally forgot about that song. You know. Yeah, Charles, that's how, Charles Erlen was a very real respected jazz organist. I mean, he's done some great things. And, you know, um, that time that the dance thing was happening and everyone was going club and the company wanted to kind of, you know, get into that market. He was a jazz guy and they wanted to hip him up and bring him into the dance thing. So, you know, they called me to do that. And I had a wonderful time working with Charles. Really, really cool guy. He's no longer with us, but he's just a brilliant cat, really great to work with. Um, I recall, as a matter of fact, uh, we had a very interesting experience together. We were rehearsing. I was on the road. I met them in, I think, Detroit. We we, uh, he played at a club the night before, and I flew in to rehearse, you know, just to get, get things going. He had his band there. And uh, we were running some things down. And I noticed, you know, uh, the guy says sometimes my charts are pretty hard or whatever. And I saw, like, one guy kind of, like, just fell out. Like, the bass player just, like, fell to the ground. I go, like, hmm? What's that about? 
And then the guitar guy fell out on the ground. I'm going like, well, what's going on? And for all of a sudden, I start feeling a little dizzy and tipsy. Anyway, it, worked, it came out that um, what happened, we had a, um, a gas leak in the club. <laughs> and we almost, almost collapsed and died uh, because it's, it, the gas had no odor, right? So we're there, and we're just like, the music, I said, man, this music is really cool. Guys are like just, <laughs> you know? I go like, you know, so I would think it's the effect of the music. I go like, this is like amazing. And the guys are just dropping like flies, right? <laughs> well, like, and then I found myself going, and the guy says, guys, get out, get out. You know, and they, they, the, some guy came, he opened the door, opened the thing, and just dragged us out. We all went to the hospital. And it was, you know, gas, a uh, gas leak in the club. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, Charles, great guy, great guy. Enjoy. I remember that track. I haven't heard it in a while, and it sounds pretty great. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that you guys played on was this one. Oh, my God. Yeah, that that was uh, that's Tamiko Jones. Yeah. Uh, Can't live without your love. Yeah, Tamika uh, Jones. Yeah. And, wow. Uh, you uh, you definitely had some interesting uh, keyboard or synth textures. You were you definitely came up at the time when there was a transition from uh, more traditional uh, keyboard or electric piano sounds mm -hmm. right up and through the the full-on synthesizer era. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you kind of talk about the, the keyboards and synths and that, how that uh, transition? Like, first of all, what you used. For that record, for example, I used the, 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 the 16 kind of thing in the back. That was like a regular clavinet, but we put it through an MXR phase shifter, and we make the big, wide open one. You know, we get that. So th that was the sound basically there. Um, and I think it was also Fender Rhodes at the bottom there somewhere uh, playing, along with the, um, uh, what do we use, an ARP or something, uh, ARP strings. Uh, you use the uh, Oberheim. Yeah, I, I used to love, uh, in a lot of tracks I used the, the Matrix 12, uh, which I got nice fat sounds. Um, matter of fact, that Sky Here's to You thing was Matrix. That was a Matrix kind of thing. Uh, the you know, Oberheim, OB, the OB-8 and OB, you know, was really in the 12, yeah, was used a lot. But y there's a time uh, we went through this change, and it was very interesting because, you know, I came from that big, lot of horn, that, the, the big horn tradition, and then all of a sudden, like, nobody wants to hear horns, nor guitar. Guitar was like, it played out. We had the DX7 came in, and, you know, and then we had the Lindrum, right? We had the DMX drum and then the Lindrum and I actually started with a Dr. Rhythm going way back <laughs> yeah, right? and the 808 and the 909 and which is funny because they're like classic pieces now you know but the funny thing I guess it's, it's interesting to me I was, I was thinking the other day I go like you know what the 808 and 901 these are supposed to have been like drum sounds like supposed to be like real drum sound it's like a failure you know the way but we finally came up with something that became it's something onto itself it's it's its own thing now, you know. But you know, I remember Lynn said, "Yeah, this is a real. We we'll get really drums, you know." It didn't really sound like drums. Like, no, it's not, you know. But it had it filled a certain space and it kind of worked, you know. And it, you know, now guys are looking for a 909. You know, the dance community took that up. The 909 sound became really cool for dance records, man. You know, um, and the 808, of course, you know. You got a whole, even the rap cats, you know, would use it. It just had a certain sound. It's just something about that, um, you know. But they, all of a sudden, horns were not happening. Guitar was definitely out. It was like anti-groove, you know, in, in that kind of music, you know. Although in rock, they kept the guitar. They kept the live drums and all that. But in, in you know, especially R&B and you know, dance music and stuff, we moved to very, very techno very hip with you know we got into technology a bit more um, and um, so as a as a band leader you know we I remember with brass construction you know brass construction brass get it we gotta use the brass but you go like mmm not happening so you'll hear a couple of albums where we didn't use as much brass we put them in a very secondary tertiary kind of stage in the production just supported it's like okay yeah we're brass group but we are hip too and we try to get that sound because you know every so often we get to go through this cycle where a certain sound becomes popular. I've just reminded, I heard the Lindrum, not the, no, the Syndrome. That boo, 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 
Oh my God. You know, they, 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 I remember Ring My Bell. Ring My Bell. Boo! You know, everybody had that. You had to have your, you know, your syndrome. And that was it. We did a record first time around when, um, was it Larry LeVan? Yeah, Larry LeVan did the mix on the, the re Sky record first time around. When, I think it's on the first album, right? Yeah, the first Sky album. And his remix was Syndrome, man. The whole, like, yeah, I remember, I, I forgot, I played the Syndrome on the record. Um, <laughs> I totally forgot. But the whole, whole, like, most the whole record is Syndrome. You know, just like a Syndrome solo. But because that was the hot sound, and it meant hip. When you hear a Syndrome, a record is hip, you know. And so we plastered it with Syndromes you know, to make it happen, you know. Um, but yeah, we went through this thing where we wanted something fresh, new. The old analog sounds, you know, the old sounds weren't hip anymore. And technology was exciting and new, it was sexy. And we wanted to have that, you know. And um, so we got into the, you know, you hear a couple of records where we, we use a bit more of the technology. Um, you know, uh, in Brass we did that, you know. Um, we did a record called Walk in the Line. And on the horns, I tried to incorporate the horns in it, but we still have more keyboard bass type of thing. You know, we use a keyboard bass in some of the records as well. And it was a very tough time for the acts, you know, because your traditional fans want you to sound the way you're supposed to sound. This is how you, you know, we want to hear more brass, we want to hear this stuff, but the general market is saying, no, we don't want that, you know. And so you got to make certain decisions. So I tried to write in the middle, you know, but then guitars weren't happening. Uh, the keyboards was taking the place of the guitar. It was a very tough period for that time. A lot of the funk bands, you know, weren't happening, you know, in the charts anymore. Um, you know, but few, you know, I mean, big bands like Earth, Wind, and Fire and stuff, you know, they did, you know, they made some of the transition. Cool and the Gang went through that transition. Matter of fact, they had the new singer. It was more vocal. And uh, words is, Cool and the Gang used to have some killer stuff. I mean, from Hollywood swinging and, all, you know, just some ma amazing stuff. I mean, I loved the Cool and the Gang stuff, you know, when they used to do some serious jazz sounding tracks as well. Um, but they just shifted. They made that shift, you know, and got into more vocal, front guy singing more vocals, and they became very successful. In the, you know, uh, great records that, that, you know, top the pop charts as well, you know, not just the R&B charts. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you do, I mean, after you've had all this success with a certain style, and and now that style is is kind of not considered hip anymore. How do you, you know, if 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 you're those guys in that situation, you know, you're brass construction, and then your pr this producer comes in and says to you, "Look, guys, your last record uh, didn't do that great. Uh, I think it's because you know brass is really just not mm -hmm. hip anymore. Uh, you guys need to call yourself DX7 construction." And like, <laughs> what, what, what do you do? I mean, how do you well, handle that? Well, we, do you just I tried to handle it. Um, it's interesting because we had a similar kind of situation when we did s some of the Sky stuff. I remember on the later records where they said, okay, we got to get with the kid, what the kids are doing. This is what the kids are doing. We'll get some of the kids in, have them write some stuff, and we'll just, you know, get a big record. And I found that a lot of that did not work. Uh, because um, it's like trying to get your dad who's, you know, 60, 55 years old and he's trying to be cool, going to the club and he puts on a thing, trying to talk hip. It just doesn't trans it doesn't come across. It's still your dad trying to be hip. <laughs> it doesn't work, you know. So um, we try to just maintain, you know, our sound. Uh, but you could do it, you could do things like, you know, the, the, the content of the song, the lyrics. You could up it, make it a little more street relevant. Uh, you could do, you know, make your lyrics a little more in the in the, in the now. You know, you know, it's like the, it's as d different as you know a guy speaking old English saying thee, thy, and thou. And okay, we don't say thee and thou anymore. Okay, we say you know we just use more mo modern parlance. So um, so you have to make that still you you know you could say the same thing, but you say it in a different in a different way. Um, you know, I try to deal with that, and you'd get some of the modern instruments incorporated. You could make them. You could get a marriage of it. Um, I think Sky was very good. Sky didn't have too many horns. You know, we didn't. It wasn't a horn-based band, but I used horns in it when it was necessary when we needed that voice. You know, but they were very. These guys were very good rock. Basically, they, they prefer playing you know, rock and roll stuff. They used to be called Fuel before then, and they played. You know, ser they could do some serious rock stuff. But for commercial reasons, we said no. This is it. We got a groove. We're gonna do this. 
and we just go with what what is what's happening at the time, you know, without losing your identity. However, you know, so um, it's a tough thing because you know you, you get this this kind of um, you have to think of: Do I do what they want me to do, or do what I want to do? You know, and you know, then you, the whole point is you want to sell records. So I mean, I could stay all day and make records that are that will please me and my you know my boys around the block, and they think I'm the greatest guy in the world. But then you go in the market, and it, you know you're not you're just talking to yourself. You know, you have to do th some things that will engage people. You, you know, seem relevant. You know, um, you know, I enough, you know, and engaging enough for them to go into their pockets and pay that, you know, the money's out uh, to buy your song. Because there are other songs out there that they may like, and they want to have a limited, they don't have a billion dollars. So if you only have 20 bucks, who am I going to spend my 20 bucks on, you know, this song or this song? So you try to make it engaging enough so you could, you know, have them listen to your stuff and buy it. You know, so you, you have to, you know, you go through this thing. Do I do what I think is in the ideal? No, you have to always consider market, the market when you put together these songs. You know, who, the first question, who, who am I speaking to? You know, what's my audience? And you, then you speak to them. You know, it's like in language, you know, if I'm going to speak to a Spanish guy, I may speak brilliant, um, uh, I may speak brilliant Latin or French, but I have to speak, you know, in his, you know, in his, his language to get through to him. And uh, so you try to make your music engaging and, 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 and something that would pull the person in so they could uh, buy your stuff. But that, all that have to do with how the instrumentation and the colors of the, the track and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, um, it's an interesting question, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, uh, around that time in the, in the mid-80s, late-80s, uh, when you were theoretically going out of style, yes. you were coming back into style in the form of uh, being sampled. Um, there were there were plenty of uh, tracks that that you did that were sampled, but um, here's here's one good example I think. You know, to take you somewhere, whatever, as corny as it may seem. Well, it it, <laughs> it, it works, and and again, you know, that was something that other people obviously picked up on, <laughs> whether it was for the groove or. You know, the bass groove or the drums are just the way the whole thing locked together. I like this song. It's one of my favorites uh, that's, uh, with Sky. Really a cool track. You know, sometimes you write a song and you have, you know, people play it and it's, it's okay. It's not exactly what you, you fully have in mind. But this the track, um, uh, this track by Sky was really well executed and, uh, you know, one of my favorites. Uh, staying with Sky and staying with stuff that uh, has been sampled. I know. Uh, <laughs> There, when you were when you were almost done, uh, I think it was the Skyport, the third Sky album. Mm -hmm. uh, you were telling me that you felt like the album wasn't finished and you needed something else. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about this? Well, Jay, this when I do next uh, track, when I do a, a record, what song is that? Oh, yes. When I um, do a record, I, you, you, you know what? It's interesting as, as producers and music and creators. You ha there's have to be a certain kind of honesty. You have to be honest with yourself. A lot of people, you know, your, your boys are around you, they'll oh man, that's cool, that sounds hype. You know, and they pump you up and you think you have the greatest track in the world. But really, you really have to step back and be objective. It's very important to longevity and to being effective as a producer, you know, because all your friends want to give you good news. They want to hype you up, man, yo, that's the bomb, you know, and they give you all this. But really, you want to step, you know, sometimes you step back and you try to be objective. And, uh, you know, so I listened to it. I did a Sky album, and uh, I, I listened to it. I go like, you know, I always said, would I buy that album? That's the one of the tests. I go, would I buy that? Would I buy it? And I listened to it. I go, it's cool, but it still needs something just to pull the album together. It's, it needs a little something, just a small something, just a transition, something to just like, give it a little rawness. And this particular tune in this album, on this album, um, I went in that day to pretty much, like I said, to, to, to put, we edit the stuff because those days was tape. We took the tape and we cut it up and, you know, do all this stuff. And I said, no, this record is not working. So I, I had an idea how, what to do. So I had the drummer, I told the drummer, go inside. I give him a beat. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Just do that. And I got 
the secretary from the studio. There's a guy delivering a pizza. I said, hey, you want to make a record? Come here. Right? I put the guy in the studio, um, you know, got some of the guys to the group, and we just came, I had this song. I got this hook. We don't need, it's called No Music, because there was no music. There's no bass guy or anything, because bass guy wasn't there. It was just something, you know, I made up. And, uh, but I thought it needed that pocket just to kind of make the whole album congeal. And so this is the track, it's the thing called No Music. And we had the sky had a thing called the Sky Zoo. We call it the Sky Zoo. It's actually, you know, um, we call it the Sky Zoo. And we just put it, the little melody on top, and this is the song. And that's, that's what the album needed, right there. <laughs> oh, man. Big silly. Yeah. So um, I want you to uh, let the people know what, you're, what you've been working on these days and, and what kind of new projects you got coming up. But also, uh, definitely, if anyone has anything they want to uh, bring up or talk about, you know, uh, uh, ask away if, if we can get the, the mics out here. What what do you what what's going on uh, with you, man? Um, well, I'm doing a couple of things. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm working on. As I said, I have a smooth an album. I decide to do, you know, um, I would you know I love the flute, and I've done a lot of things with with brass, which features the brass and and uh, the horns, etc. And sky, which you heard the kind of pocket they have. And I always wanted to do, you know. Um, Something with my flute, something mellow. I was just gonna do some straight ahead jazz, but the smooth jazz genre is growing. Uh, it's it's a really interesting the new jazz thing is happening, and I wanted to do something really just different from what I've done in the past uh, because I think uh, there are different as different aspects to me. I have different musical selves, and this is one that I think has not been really revealed. You know, uh, you know. So I decided to do this this thing called. Form a group called Randy Muller Boom Chang Bang. The weirdest name, right? Can't even fit on a thing. Uh, but I was, you know, name, I love names and I think, you know, this Boom Chang Bang. What is a Boom Chang Bang? I myself don't even know, but it just sounds cool. So it's Randy Muller Boom Bang Chang and I just did um, this CD. Also doing a 70s uh, funk album. And this is very exciting to me because it's more going back to this kind of stuff. Uh, the name of the act is Soul Biscuits. And Soul Biscuits is going to be with the live stuff, incorporating some of the new technology as well. But we have, we're going to have live horns, uh, funky drums and guitar, the same kind of cheesy vocals I used to do with the simple hooks. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's something I want to do, you know, is to go back to basics. You know, you go all out to the, to the end, and then you go back to basics. And Soul, Soul Bis Bis Biscuits is going to be that. I'm also doing a hip-hop artist called Shadina. Uh, more like a Mary J. Blige kind of thing. Um, and I think she's just a brilliant singer, so we're going to you know, do some of that as well. So I'm working on those albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And you've also uh, worked with Kenny Dope pretty extensively to oh, yeah, uh, okay. reissue your back catalog. And, and uh, I think there's a couple CDs out at least uh, that collect uh, a lot of this stuff. Yeah, Kenny and I, we did an album called Randy Muller's Best. We just took a lot of the old stuff, Went back, got the original 16 track and 24 track masters. And, you know, because some guys, they put these compilations together. It's basically the same song. They just put a bunch of them on, on a thing. We decided to go back, get the original masters and mix them so it has more of the modern punch technology, you know, goes through an SSL or whatever, well, which we didn't have in those days. And just give it a little more punch. We don't mess around with it too much. We just kept it very pure. And uh, just give it a little more fidelity. That's basically it. And Kenny did a great job with that hooked it up, rocked it, you know, a couple of edits. And um, so that's an album out now to a CD called Randy Muller's Best. Um, Kenny Doe presents Randy Muller's Best. So and they can check this stuff out at... Uh, uh, you could do, oh, it's like a commercial. Um, you could go to, my, my label is called Plaza Records. You could go to plazarecords.com, uh, you know, to check out a lot of stuff we have. Uh, also, Track Source, most of you guys are into dance music. Track Source is a great place to get good funky dance music and great stuff. So you could go to Track Source and look for Plaza on the P, Plaza Records. Uh, for the smooth jazz stuff, it's, um, it's on my other label called Wave Hill, Wave Hill Records, wavehillrecords.com. Um, and the CD, actually, they'll mail it out to you from cdbaby.com. So you go to cdbaby.com, 
you'll get the um, Randy Mother Boom Bang Chang. It just came out last week, as a matter of fact. All right. So uh, anybody out there got something to say? Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. You got to wait for the microphone. Check. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's, obvi there's this obvious progression from in the string writing and the facility with the string writing from you know, the early BT Express stuff to the later Sky stuff. And I was wondering if there was a point where you uh, specifically checked out string music. Um, and if so, what was it? Uh, I can't, well, I, I said I love um, the stuff out of Philly. Tom Bell, I mean, I listen to, it, to Tom Bell a lot. The old stylistic stuff. Oh, my God. The, the arrangements are just like butter. If you listen to that, it's just wonderful, great writing. This man just writes great stuff. So I listen to Tom Bell's stuff. Um, also, a, another guy, really cool uh, um, arranger that I used to listen to a lot was Van McCoy. He ended up with doing The Hustle, oh, that yeah, big record. Yeah, yeah. But he was a great guy. He did a lot of charts around town. Uh, so I like you know, what he was doing. There's a lot, bunch of cats, but a lot of stuff. I just love the Tom Bell stuff. I listen to it and you know, just take it in. You know, so yes, I, I listen to a lot of stringy stuff, you know. Um, you know, a lot of stuff out of Philly. I just love that Philly thing later on. I love what they were doing there. Uh, just great music. I mean, you know, uh, just good stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's my, most of my string stuff is out of Philly. You know, not counting the classical stuff and the other things I would listen to, but um, I think Tom Bell. I listen to a lot of Tom Bell stuff. Mm -hmm. You mentioned gospel earlier, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to know if you actually work with um, Shirley Caesar. Well, I did arrange with a song called "No Charge." I don't yes. know if you know that song. Oh, you yes, do know that I song. Do. Yeah, <laughs> "No song. Charge" uh, was a song. You know, it was brought to me. It says, "Okay, we needed to put some things to this." And uh, yeah, I did the string arrangement for that song, and I think it, it you know, it's a classic now for her. And um, it was an honor, because I didn't know who Shirley Caesar was. Honestly, I didn't know. You know, it was like, this person called Shirley Caesar, you know, and the guy said, no, she's really big. You know, I didn't know. I just, like, did it, and it's a really interesting song, because it's such an honest song about a young guy, you know, mother tells him to go take out the garbage, and he wants to charge her, you know. If we take it out, you know, I'll charge you X amount. The mother goes, you know, give you this list, you know, for the cost of carrying you, no charge, for, the, for all the stuff I did for you, no charge. And she just, like, slammed him with this stuff, and it's just a great record. What mm -hmm. was it like working with her? You know, you know, I didn't know. She did the vocals before, and then I came in and did the stuff, you know. But, I, you know, she's just performing. Last week, she just performed in New York. They had a, 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 a night of healing, it, I think it's called. Um, just, I understand she's just, uh, you know, the Reverend uh, Shirley C. She's just a wonderful person from what I hear, a uh, really cool person. Oh, so you haven't been able to meet her all No, no, I haven't seen, no. I've <laughs> seen her perform. I've not sat with Shirley C. no, and have a discussion or anything. Oh, my goodness. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> all right. Anybody, uh, oh. Um. Uh, since you started making music, the way people um, listen to music has changed a lot, from vinyl to iPods. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what you thought about that. Do you um, do you think it's how how does it make people experience music differently? Today, it's a lot about the sound. Like I said, we we just put together these these blocks of sound, you know, you build, you know, they talk about Phil, Phil Spector with the wall of sound. We do that. We have that ability what we do. We could just layer a bunch of stuff. I mean, I just got into using the stylus, you know, um, which is really cool. You know, you just get a whole bunch of stuff and just, I have a track on the Soul Biscuits thing. I decided to use some of the stylus thing just to, you know, because I've, I've stayed away from plugins, but now I'm starting to, you know, use a bit more. So I got into the trilogy and, and the stylus thing which is just a great tool, you know. Um, so I started using that. And, and also, I've, there's one track I did where I used the stylus and the live drummer together. I integrated the two. And it goes from using the stylus, and I have the live drummer take over the song, and I go back into, you know, it's just a weird kind of thing I'm trying to do, just integrating the two. 
uh, because the starts can give you really live sounding stuff. It's like a guy playing, and if you know how to manipulate properly, you could really, you know, because I like my beats. I want it precisely a certain, you know, a certain way. Uh, in many, in some cases, and you know, you could get it, and you could also with the styles with certain stuff. A style is commercial, but you could, you know, you could make the tempo go up and shift, you know, put a, hu you know, kind of a human touch to it. But in terms of today with sound, um, I think today it's more about a sound experience, and um, you know, sometimes you know, some some songs now don't even have bass; they don't even use a bass or anything. They could just, you know, because the frequency spectrum is all. You know, taking care of you. you have something at the bottom of 808 or something, taking care of the sub, the bottom frequency, the range. So the song has that wide spectrum. You can still get it. Um, so I think we listen. I think that the list, average listener is very sophisticated. Uh, they got used to good sound today. You know, we listen to stuff. They may not tell you, oh, it needs, you know, s you know, 60 hertz and, you know, we need all this stuff. They could go, I like that one. I don't like that one. They don't know why. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to do an analysis. But they're very, very aware of, you know, the sound of how it hits them, uh, you know. Whereas before, I think we have a, a little more emotional ingredient, you know, just the interplay and the, the stuff. It, it's, it, it was a different kind of, a, a different kind of, um, people listen, listening for something, you know, sometimes maybe just the lyric, the song, the lyric is so strong, it could carry it. You don't even care about the beat as much as what, you know, what the person is saying. Today, I think we're actually Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation. You know, for, for what we do, you know, we gotta have a kick and beat. The sounds gotta be right, you know. And for what, you know, for dance music and for the popular stuff we do, it is like a rhythm nation. You gotta have, and the sounds gotta be correct, you know. That's what it's about today. I mean, but in a, in a way, nothing's changed because when you talk about how oh, you yeah. guys used to write the songs, it's gotta oh, have yeah. that that yep. low end. Yep. That's gotta be pumping. Yeah. Yeah. But now it's like, you know, let's say in those days we drank pure water and then someone just introduced a little sugar into it and we said, hmm, tastes good. And we put a little more, we got used to it, you know, we, you know, we, we just want to, we, we got to used to the good sound, you know. And like I said, this whole thing is, it's, it evolves, you know, it's like I said, like a Darwinian kind of thing where we take the best and, you know, the sampling, you take the best sounds of that period and we recycle it and goose it up even more and make something even stronger. And when we took like, four of those things and put them together in terms of samples, and we got something totally new, but that much stronger, you know? And we, we, you know, today we listen to sound spectrums, and we know, we don't get too deep in analysis, but we know we want our kick to have a little bottom to it. Sometimes listening to a song, it needs like 30 hertz. You know, I remember in the old days, we would do, with the Sky stuff, we always had some, we used to boost that 60 hertz on the Poltec, or we go to the 30, like a plus two on the 30. You know, just for the kick, just for the bass, just to give it that drop. You know, we want drop to the record for certain types. You know, now if you're doing deep rock and roll, you know, you don't care about the bottom as much. You know, but in in let's say the R&B stuff we're doing in the dance stuff, that that bottom is very important. Mm -hmm. okay. um, most uh, records we listened to um, were sampled in the '90s, um, house tracks, and um, you didn't get any uh, credits or something. How do you no. feel about that? <laughs> no, some of them we did get credits. Um, you know, we have a very good um, publishing administrator. I mean, that high record was done by uh, Too Short did a whole record called, was it Post and High or something? No, there's one called Post and High. But Too Short, a rapper, you know, had a great, you know, he did something with high. and He, he actually had the, 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 the word high in the title. Um, you know, we, for some records, some of the things slipped through the cracks, but for the most part, we started to, work deals out with the you know, various companies for compensation or we get, um, you know, credit. Today we'll give us some credit on, on it. So, you know, we're lucky in that way. Some of them, it's just so long ago, just forget about it. <laughs> All right. Um, could we maybe also listen to some of your new stuff, like hip-hop or...? Oh, you want to listen to the new stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, Can I see this? Yeah, you could do... Uh, I could open this, huh? Okay. You do the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you want? It's totally, it's totally different. Uh, but there's a song in there, the, uh, the, the title track called Grooving You, on there, um, that I wanted to create something very 70s, late 70s, uh, the 70s kind of feel, uh, but yet smooth jazz. 
but yet very raw. And you will hear um, Grooving You, which is a. Um, then I have a house track, which is done. Um, Kenny Dope did uh, a mix on it, um, a thing called uh, Devotion, where I put a gospel sounding singer with the flute. It's just like taking smooth, quote, smooth jazz and new jazz to another place. It's very housey. Uh, this one, Grooving You, is, no, I think it's number three, is it? Then I have something that's more. That's grooving. That's it, it's done for. It's interesting. This is not done for like a, a dance, or it's done for more like a, a smooth jazz. You know, very adult. So wait, audience. smooth jazz is in hit, man. Yeah, it's, I know. It's, it's a, but we have a track there. You know, just to give you um, a thing called um, "Standing in Standing in the Rain," which is like a very different thing. Just to show you the, the range of what I'm doing. Oh, what is that six? It's very different in the first track. You know. But um, you'll find, like, for example, the Soul Biscuits thing, it's a very, di very different than that. I'll give you, it's not out yet. This is just a rough. But um, just to show you a bit of what we're doing now. Um, this is a song I wrote in high school, actually, uh, going back. This is Soul Biscuits going back. And matter of fact, the horns are not real. I just was playing a sampler. Matter of fact, the sampler couldn't even hold it out. I was sketching it because I'm putting live horns on the track. So this is my rough draft of Soul Biscuit. Um, uh, number one. It has to be mixed and the sound's got to be stronger. Well, these are just ideas, you know, that I'm, I'm, do I'm working with. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, maybe two little things before we see you off. Um, the first one would be, one could find it rather remarkable to see you embrace working with Kenny Dope so strongly. And, I mean, here's a guy who puts a great deal of detail and attention to detail he can I don't know tune like a hi-hat for six hours or something and maybe um, could you recall and retell how you got first um, well, well to know of him and um, the intricacies of his work and maybe if that in some sort of way correlated with what you were doing you know I don't, I don't you know uh, I don't um you know, I, I really don't, sometimes, you know, I don't really look back to see what I've done and, and sometimes not even realize, you know, my connection to other things. As a matter of fact, um, it's only recently I, I, I kind of like connected that, that track that uh, Monk played, the GQ thing, with what I've done, you know. I tend to look, I, you know, I don't reflect too much uh, what I do, so I, I, I can't um, get specific uh, if you want me to kind of connect. Um, my work to someone else, um, but I, I. Okay. Did you find? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Did you find out about the bucket heads before the paycheck was from the publisher? Was well, in the, mail the, or did the you bucket heads are fine. Well? Kenny had done it before, and then I found out afterwards, right? Um, but uh, they did they did the right thing. They went through the publishers and they got the clearance, and uh, I was happy that he did it. You know that because um, a lot of the tracks to me, it's like I'm finished with it. It's, it's finished. It's old. It's done. And then here's someone that comes and just like put some life into it and recontextualize the whole track and give it a new life and introduce it to a new generation. I think it's great. I encourage it, as a matter of fact. You know? uh, matter of fact, I'm working on just taking a bunch of my tracks and putting it on a CD and just sending it to producers. Guys want to mix it? Fine with me. Uh, I encourage it because you know, it keeps it alive. You know? um, speaking of, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You're, up. You're on. Yeah. Oh. Uh, speaking of keeping it alive, I mean, we trust you're a musician, but um, is this keyboard thing there just set up in front there because it looks good, or <laughs> is there any particular reason? It's great aesthetic. It just looks uh, <laughs> <it's> great. <laughs> well, that was just in case I wanted to demo something, uh, whatever. But I This think could yeah. as well be the case, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you saw me to play some chords? <laughs> um, play some chords, man. Show us that you're a real musician. Oh, it was. <laughs> I don't know what the uh, oh, this is jazzy. Um, I, the thing is, a lot of the funk thing, you need a good beat to kind of kind of groove. And uh, I don't think I'm gonna move to sing a ballad at this point. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm known to play the keyboards now and then. <laughs> so <laughs> so if uh, maybe if some of y'all can set up a good beat while <laughs> while uh, Randy's <laughs> hanging around here, <laughs> we might be able to uh, entice him to get into the studio for a couple minutes and uh, show us a little something. But um, as for now, uh, I'd like to wind it up and 
definitely uh, thank Randy for coming down and talking to us. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah.